Welcome to ADP Training, YouTube's automotive technology channel. In this channel, you'll learn all kinds of auto repair secrets, how your automobile works, and how to diagnose it. This video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. ABS Speed Sensor Simulator have you ever had a vehicle, where the ABS is prematurely activated in an intermittent way? And, have you asked yourself, is it the wheel speed sensors, the ABS computer, or another electronic issue with the system? Well, the ABS speed sensor simulator is here to save the day. In today's vehicles, the vehicle speed sensor is no longer used. Now, one of the wheel speed sensors is used as an input of vehicle speed. This is done in order to reduce redundant components, which do the same thing. So, when using the ABS speed sensor simulator, remember that it can also be used to diagnose the vehicle speed sensor. The ABS speed sensor simulator is a four-channel output unit. It's made with four diode isolated channels. This allows you to kill each channel independently, without affecting the other channel. Here's how the ABS speed sensor simulator works. The ABS speed sensor simulator is based on the ubiquitous LM555 oscillator timer chip. The circuit itself is small, but powerful. It is composed of three sections, the LM555 timer microchip part, the output transistor driver part, and the output signal part. The signal section has an impedance matching and isolation transformer. This in effect isolates the ABS speed sensor simulator from any shorted wheel speed sensor short to vehicle power. The ABS speed sensor simulator also has a frequency variable potentiometer to adjust the output frequency of the signal. Also, the idea behind the four normally on output switches, is to kill the signal independently to be able to test the ABS response. But, more on how to use the ABS speed sensor simulator later. The ABS speed sensor simulator allows you to test the ABS and traction control response, without ever leaving the repair shop. Yes, that's right, just lift all four tires off the ground, connect and check. The ABS speed sensor simulator LM555 chip can be found anywhere. The entire ABS speed sensor simulator can be built for less than $8 making for a very useful piece of equipment that'll last you for many years to come. This video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. ABS Speed Sensor Simulator, Bleeding the Brakes the ABS speed sensor simulator can also be used to bleed the brake system valve body and pump. Yes, that's right, and you can do it all without the use of a dedicated scan tool. In other words, for those who don't know, 
the ABS system has to be bled any time there was a brake fluid leak, or when the ABS hydraulic valve body has been replaced. For this, you need a factory level scan tool, which will set you back a few thousand dollars. Well, the ABS speed sensor simulator is here to the rescue. Basically, what you do is actuate the ABS valve body hydraulic unit, and on some systems you may need to crack open the bleeder screws. Most of the times, the trapped air will rise to the surface, and end up at the brake pump cylinder reservoir. So, here's how you use the ABS speed sensor simulator to bleed the ABS system. Important note. Please, remember that before you do this procedure, you have to gravity bleed the brakes normally, as you would in a normal situation. First, connect the ABS speed sensor simulator's four outputs to the signal wire at each wheel speed sensor. Second, raise the car's four tires, and start the car in neutral. Please refer to our previous section on using the ABS speed sensor simulator. Third, remove the master cylinder reservoir cap, and leave it off. This is done so the trapped air can rise to the top. Otherwise, the air pocket will not allow the brakes to bleed. Four, without touching the brake pedal, shift to drive, do not accelerate, and press one of the signal kill buttons at the ABS speed sensor simulator. This action will activate the ABS systems, and you'll hear all the ABS solenoids operating. Do this about four to six times. Finally, go outside into the engine compartment, and if your vehicle calls for you to crack open the ABS bleeders, do so at this time. Then again, press the kill buttons a few times, and crack open the ABS bleeder screws. Do not crack open the bleeder screws at the brake calipers. This is the lowest hydraulic point that won't trap air. Besides, you should have done a normal brake bleeding procedure before you started. This procedure is meant to bleed the trapped air inside the ABS hydraulic valve body. By using the ABS speed sensor simulator you don't need an expensive factory scanner, that will set you back thousands of dollars. When it comes to bleeding the ABS system, this is it, this is exactly what the OEM factory scanner does, when doing an ABS bleeding sequence. Rest assured that the ABS speed sensor simulator will make it worthwhile for you, for many years to come. video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. ABS Speed Sensor Simulator the ABS speed sensor simulator is a useful and versatile tool. It can kill each wheel speed signal selectively. The idea here is to prove that the ABS module, hydraulic pump and solenoids are operational before condemning any of these expensive parts. But, before we start, a word of warning. Do not use the ABS speed sensor simulator while the vehicle is moving. This is not a road test equipment, and you're liable to cause an accident. The ABS speed sensor simulator is meant to allow you to test the ABS system, without having to go for a road test, which is time consuming. To use the ABS speed sensor simulator, do the following. 1. Lift the vehicle's four tires, and set the transmission in neutral. 
Remember, all you want to do is perform an ABS actuation, by killing the signal with one of the four buttons. 2. Disable the traction control, which is now part of the ABS system, but will skew your results for the ABS test. 3. Remember, you'll have to step on the brakes for this test to work. Disconnect all the ABS wheel speed sensors. Then, connect each of the ABS speed sensor simulator output channels to each ABS signal wire. Place the ABS speed sensor simulator on the passenger seat, and set the ABS speed sensor simulator frequency knob to its lowest setting. 4. With the car raised from the ground, and secure, start the car in neutral, not in park, and don't step on the brakes. Why? It's simple, once the ABS speed sensor simulator is connected, it starts sensing a signal to the ABS computer. When it does, if you start in park, the ABS computer will issue a code, and go into limp in mode. Simply put, there's no way that a vehicle in park can have a wheel speed sensor signal. It is called a logic fault and flagged by the ABS module as a code issuing failure. So, start the vehicle in neutral, it is then ok for the ABS module to see a wheel speed signal, and we can proceed with the test. Then, let the car idle and set it to drive. Do not accelerate, or step on the brakes. Remember that the brake switch is the only indicator for the ABS to go active, 5. Now you have the ABS speed sensor simulator connected, the car in drive, the foot off the brakes, and you're ready to do the test. At this time, slowly raise the frequency knob to a higher setting, or even the highest setting. To test the ABS system, softly step on the brakes, and then quickly press one of the signal kill buttons on the ABS speed sensor simulator. Right away, you'll see an ABS actuation. You'll continue to see an ABS actuation even if the wheels are not rolling, since the ABS speed sensor simulator is acting as a wheel speed signal output device. Every time you step on the brakes, and press the ABS speed sensor simulator kill button, the ABS will then go into action. The ABS speed sensor simulator works, because it creates a signal on all four wheels. Without the ABS speed sensor simulator, this is impossible to do with just the car up on the lift. You can even bleed the ABS system, by running a remote brake switch, and using the ABS speed sensor simulator, but more on this later. Now, what did you learn by doing the operation we just explained? Well, quite a lot actually. 1. You know the ABS computer is up to the task. 2. You also know the ABS hydraulic pump is operational. Otherwise, the ABS will sense a low hydraulic brake fluid pressure, go into limp in mode, and cancel any actuation. So, now you also know that the ABS hydraulic pressure sensor is fine. And 3, since you heard all the ABS solenoids clicking on and off, you know they're also fine. Otherwise, since the solenoids are nice and hot, the ABS module will sense a short or open signal, and set a code. The ABS speed sensor simulator, can also be used to test the wheel speed sensor wiring harness. In this case, you do the previous procedure but rather than do a brake pedal actuation, just go around the car and wiggle the wires. Any wiring issues, usually under the body panels, or on a vehicle that's been in an accident, will become apparent and the ABS module will then issue a sensor specific code. The ABS speed sensor simulator can be used to test many ABS related issues. Some ABS hydraulic pumps, also tend to fail after repeated ABS actuation periods. 
So, just do a few ABS activations, as mentioned before, and rest assured that hydraulic pump will get nice and hot, revealing any issue. And, all this is done without leaving your home or repair shop. The ABS speed sensor simulator is a versatile tool, with the ability to serve you for many years to come. Air fuel ratio sensors are a um, specialized oxygen sensor that's uh, now pretty much used uh, throughout the automotive industry. It has already replaced the uh, standard old zirconia uh, O2 sensor. Now these uh, sensors operate totally different. Uh, so for that we created the, uh, the AFR um, fuel ratio sensor uh, meter. So this is a very sensitive um, it's it's an output it's it's a current uh, amp probe really that's what it is a and it outputs a a voltage that goes to uh, either a graphene multimeter a scope or your regular multimeter uh, now uh, this unit it's uh, totally different th than wh whatever you're going to see uh, on the um, on the market today most of the units uh, today that you see on the market are th what they really th what they do it's they measure uh, a voltage in the milliamp range uh, which is really not uh, it's it, it, that has nothing to do with an air fuel ratio sensor the air fuel ratio sensor uh, sensors operate uh, uh, th they actually operate on current flow not necessarily on voltage uh, my unit that's what it does it actually converts that uh, vo uh, that that current flow which is in the milliamp range um, into a voltage that you can plot on the scope uh, graphing multimeter or your um, or your multimeter that way you'll see only numbers but but, but nevertheless you, you can still use your multimeter uh, with the, with the unit here you can see the basic construction of the AFR air fuel ratio sensor itself uh, the, the the inside of the sensor it's a uh, it's a totally different unit it's a, it has a uh, monitoring chamber a diffusion chamber and it has a circuit uh, in inside the ECM that actually uh, controls the current flow. Uh, it's important to understand that AFR sensors, when they they operate the other way, uh, the inverse of the old O2 sensors. Uh, so if current, if it's on the rich side, you're going to see negative milliamps, and they usually range plus or minus 10 milliamp in that range, more or less. It could go above or be or, or below that, uh, but nevertheless you know the operation is, is exactly the same so if you see negative milliamps the unit uh, it's that means it's rich uh, the uh, air fuel uh, uh, the the air fuel ratio it's on the rich side if you see positive uh, flow of milliamps then it and then it's then it's a lean condition which is the opposite of the old uh, of the old units now the AFR meter tester uh, has a very sensitive um, current um, microprocessor inside uh, that actually m measures um, the actual um, the flow or either way this is this is the reason why the unit uh, also rides on a specific um, it, it rides on on 5.6 volts so 5.6 would be pretty much zero that would be zero flow okay uh, if you see below 5.6, you, then you get, you're having a negative um, current flow. If you see above 5.6, then you, get, you have a positive. Now, when it comes to measuring um, actual AFR, AFR, air fuel ratio sensors, then you're going to be on the lower scale. Uh, so you're going to be on the AFR. Uh, the switch is going to be on the AFR side. Uh, and so, and the, so you're going to be riding on about 0.8 volts. Uh, and it's going to go up and down from that. So you're going to ride on 5.6 if you're go if you're measuring a battery voltage, the, the battery parasitic uh, volt a voltage draw, uh, the one that actually drains the battery overnight. And we're going to do another video on that later on. Uh, so, but going back to the AF AFR air fuel ratio sensor, 
uh, if you go into the uh, on the lower scale the AFR set the switch on normal and the lower switch on the AFR side um, pretty much you're going to be reading very very minute um, uh, current flow in the milliamp range now as you can see on the uh, um, on the diagram on screen uh, what happens is that the ECM actually inverts the polarity of the current flow this is why air fuel ratio sensors operate on current flow not on voltage uh, the uh, the units that you see on, on the market today, they're not really, they're, as I said before, they're milliamp, they're voltmeters in the milliamp range, which you can, you can actually do that with your own meter. Uh, so you don't, you don't need to deal with that. Just put a resistor in there and, and, and I mean, that's easy. That, that's, but you have to be able to read. Um, if you, even if you put a resistor in there, you're, you're altering the circuit. So you have to be able to read uh, the a air fuel um, ratio meter, uh, this unit, actually operates in series with the air far signal wire you you have to disconnect the signal wire and this is pretty simple just uh, uh, disconnect the pin um, uh, and pretty much or you could rig yourself a, a jumper set of jumper wires and you could just go you have to go in series with the ECM between the ECM and the AFR uh, sensor itself but having said that this unit doesn't alter the readout doesn't in any way shape or form and as you can see on screen again, you know, you can actually, the, what you're reading is actually the flow of uh, electrons uh, in the milliamp range going in w w one way or the other. So above zero, it's on the lean side, uh, below zero, uh, on the negative side, you're going to read uh, milliamps flowing the other way around in the opposite direction. In future videos, we're going to explain how the unit operates, how to set it exactly. There is also a calibration uh, uh, switch in there, a, a setting on the switch uh, that you use to calibrate the unit or, or pretty much to under to know that the unit is working properly. Uh, so that there is a flow, uh, the, the circuitry actually flows current in one direction when you go into calibrate. Uh, that way it, it operates as if it, ha as if it had an internal uh, air fuel ratio sensor uh, so that you know that the, the, the thing is working properly. And, and the other way, the, the other uh, purpose of this unit is to measure um, millivolts uh, for parasitic uh, current draw. The, the stuff that, you know, everybody complains about, you know, battery draining overnight. Uh, and you disconnect the, uh, even if you use a, a multimeter, it's, it's not going to work. The multimeters are really, they suck at reading anything below 300 millivolts. Uh, and 300 millivolts, it's just, it's, it's almost, a, it's a big short, you know. A lot of these uh, parasitic draws are in the uh, um, 15 to 20, um, anything above 15 milliamps, it's, it's going to drain the battery. But the problem is that reading anything, you know, below 50 milliamps, it's not that easy. This unit, it's 100% it's right on the money. It's a microprocessor controlled and it, it definitely reads anything that has to do with battery parasitic draw. This video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Something wonderful is about to happen, all these worlds are yours, except Europa, attempt no landing there, use them together, use them in peace, this is how 12,000 signing off. Amplified Injector Coil Magnetic Detector The Amplified Injector Coil Magnetic Detector is a unique gadget. 
it is capable of detecting the magnetic signature of ignition coils, injectors, as well as many other types of devices that draw current. It can even detect the magnetic field from a magnetic crank or cam sensor, without any physical connection to it. How is this possible? Well, simply put, all electrical devices do put out a magnetic signature or field, which is detected by the amplified injector coil magnetic detector probe, actually a simple inductor coil, and amplified by the circuit. The amplified injector coil magnetic detector is meant to be used with an oscilloscope or graphing multimeter, where it is then plotted into a waveform for measurements. As with our other gadget of the same nature, the injector coil magnetic detector, you can also encase the amplified injector coil magnetic detector in a PCV enclosure and a clear body of a pen for the probe. This simple gadget is built into a universal printed circuit board found at any electronics parts place for a few cents. Here's how the circuit operates. The probe tip is composed of an inductor or coil of 1 milli henrys, encased into the clear body of a pen. The output of the inductor probe tip is fed into the 741 op amp, which then acts as a waveform amplifier with about a gain of 20. The 741 op amp is an inexpensive chip, that's mounted on the universal PC board, combined costing less than a dollar. The other resistors and capacitors are standard supporting components for the 741. A 2.2 mega ohm potentiometer is then used as a gain control to adjust the output taken after the 220 microfarads and 10 ohm resistor. A switch is also used to turn the op amp on and off, and the entire amplified injector coil magnetic detector runs on a 9 volt battery, readily available anywhere. Finally, remember that the output of the amplified injector coil magnetic detector is fed into an oscilloscope or graphing meter. There is no other way to detect ignition issues on a faulty injectors or ignition coil faster than with a scope. The use of the amplified injector coil magnetic detector and oscilloscope will allow you, by remote control, to detect if the issue is a bad spark plug, injector driver, clogged injector, faulty coil, ignition wires or any other issue impossible to prove without a scope. The usefulness of this device is that the actual waveform can be captured without making a physical contact with the wires. Companies like Snap-on and Sun have carried devices such as this one in the past, but are nowhere else to be found today. The amplified injector coil magnetic detector is easy to make, and with experience can be utilized in ways that'll satisfy you, and provide years of service. In this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Something wonderful is about to happen, all these worlds are yours, except your open, attempt no landing there, use them together, use them in peace, this is how 12,000 signing off. Amplified Sensor Tester how many times have you felt the need for a simple gadget that lets you easily test crank and cam sensors, wheel speed sensors, and even oxygen sensors? Well, this is it. This one does take a bit of work to assemble, but by far it is considered an easy project. The way the amplified sensor tester works is by amplifying the input signal, to be able to drive the LED indicators. 
Most sensors, even if they produce a high enough voltage, do not carry much current to drive the LED. This can be said of magnetic crank and wheel speed sensors, O2 sensors and various others. A voltmeter can be used to see voltage, but the human brain wasn't meant to process fast moving digital numbers. In case of our gadget, the LED will quickly identify the incoming signal. At the same time, the variable resistor or potentiometer can be used to control the gain or amplification factor of the unit. The 25 cents, 741 op amp, is the core of the amplified sensor tester. Its non-inverting input is used to test the signal for polarity. It has a gain of around 150, which enables it to test very low voltage levels, as in a magnetic crank sensor, or an O2 sensor. The test result is displayed through the two LEDs 1 and 2. LED 1, lights up by positive polarity, and LED 2, lights up by negative polarity. If testing a wheel speed sensor for example, you would see a blinking green and red LED, depending on the rotational speed of the wheel. With a simple universal PC board, you'll be able to build and solder the entire circuit, and get many years of service out of this amplified sensor tester. In this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Optical Cam and Crank Sensor Simulator Have you ever had an issue with a no-start condition, and asked yourself, I wish I had a spare cam or crank sensor to try out? I wish I knew if was the AECM or the sensor itself? Well, Here's the optical cam and crank sensor simulator to the rescue. Yes, this is a small, simple, versatile, and very ingenious gadget. The optical cam and crank sensor simulator is capable of simulating any crankshaft or camshaft signal. The one component that determines the output sensor signal produced by the sensor is the optical signature diagram. OK fine, but what is the optical signature diagram? Where can you buy one of these? The answer to that question is simple, you make it yourself. Understand that, what we're going to show you here, is cutting edge ingenuity. Not because it's complicated, but because it's incredibly simple to make, and full of common sense. So. We'll first show you how the optical cam and crank sensor simulator circuit works, then we'll delve into the construction of the optical signature diagram. Later on, we'll then show you how to use the optical cam and crank sensor simulator. The optical cam and crank sensor simulator circuit works as follows. The circuit, like many of the circuits in this series, is based on the venerable LM555 microchip. The LM555 is an oscillator chip. It creates a square waveform from the components attached to it. The entire circuit is divided into three parts, the photoelectric sensor, based on the SB5, from manufacturer, Amran, which by the way, it's a $4 part. Then there's also the LM555 microchip section, which takes the output from the ASP5, and acts as a Schmidt trigger amplifier. A Schmidt trigger does nothing, unless there's a considerable change in the input. The LM555 is used so that the optical cam and crank sensor simulator will not output a signal from just random light noise, especially in a repair shop environment. So, for the optical cam and crank sensor simulator to output a signal, 
the rotational speed of the engine has to be at least 200 rpm. The final part of the circuit, is a simple transistor, feeding a transformer, that changes the square wave output into a sine wave. This is done, for vehicles that use a magnetic two-wire cam or crank sensor. If your vehicle uses a three-wire sensor, then use the output signal at the top, which is a square wave output. The optical cam and crank sensor simulator also has an LED for diagnostic purposes, which is used to test the gadget operation. So, as you can see, this is a $15 circuit, encased into a PVC pipe, and using a low-cost camera mount, available at any consumer electronics store. There's also a camera positioning arm that can be used with the optical cam and crank sensor simulator. More than likely, this camera arm will cost you more than the optical cam and crank sensor simulator itself. But, that is beyond our control. Okay, now you know the basic operation of the circuit, and building it is a breeze, considering how few components it has. Now, let's analyze the before-mentioned optical signature diagram. The optical cam and crank sensor simulator outputs a high signal state whenever there's a white or dark mark in front of the ASP5 optical sensor. So, assuming we use a wheel for explanation purposes, anytime the optical cam and crank sensor simulator sees a white mark, it goes low, and, any time it sees a dark mark, it goes high. That, is what creates the changing square waveform output. If the output is taken at the transformer, then you see a sine or rounded waveform. Okay, so what about this optical signature diagram? Well, the optical cam and crank sensor simulator is in effect a universal cam or crank sensor simulator. But, the output signal has to be synchronized with the engine. So, you create a specific optical signature diagram per engine, to give you the exact cam or crank signal signature output. Yes, by simply printing out a marked wheel, you can generate the exact cam or crank signal as the original sensor. To make and use the optical signature diagram, do the following. Let's consider a crank sensor signal as an example. First, you must get the actual crank sensor signal waveform from a previous recording, for that exact engine. This is why we've always stressed the importance of a waveform database. There are also various publications dealing with waveforms, or even in the internet. Also remember, you do this only once per vehicle engine size. Here we'll use a 1989 BMW 325 crank sensor signal signature. The first thing you do is divide the crank sensor waveform into 360, which corresponds to the 360 degrees of rotation. Then, do the following. Using a black marker and a ruler, draw concentric lines every time you see a signal change, or a wave crest. Very easy to do, and for every white and dark mark, the optical cam and crank sensor simulator will also output a signal crest. Once you have the optical signature diagram done, scan it, and save in as an image file on your computer. You can also use a simple drawing software to draw the optical signature diagram. Now you actually have everything you need, to develop your own crank sensor signal, that actually corresponds to that vehicle engine size. Next, we'll show you how to apply the optical signature diagram to the actual engine, and make the engine start using the optical cam and crank sensor simulator. The idea here is to develop various optical signature diagrams over time, over many makes and models, and over many engine sizes 
and truly make the optical cam and crank sensor simulator, a universal cam and crank sensor signal simulator, that will render many, many years of service, even on future engines that haven't even been developed yet. As said before, the optical signature diagrams, are universal in nature, and render the optical cam and crank sensor simulator the viable tool for years to come. In this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Optical Cam and Crank Sensor Simulator how to use. We previous saw how the optical cam and crank sensor simulator circuit works, and how to develop the optical signature diagram. Now, let's find out how to use the optical cam and crank sensor simulator, and the optical signature diagram in a real world application. But first, let's learn how to change the optical signature diagram into a usable tool. Well, the answer is very simple. From a known crank sensor waveform, as said before, we get the series if white, and dark marks that determine the crank sensor signal or signature. Now here's where it gets interesting. What you do is convert the long signal signature diagram, into a circular diagram, using the same signature. Use any photo editing software out there, and then use the polar coordinates effect or filter to warp the linear image, into a rounded image seen here. It is that simple. Then, all you do is print the circular signature diagram, cut it into a round piece of paper, and stick or glue it to the crank shaft pulley. You can even use sticky paper to do the printing, just peel the back and stick it to the front of the crank pulley. Ok, now you know how to apply the optical signature diagram to the engine. Now, let's learn how to synchronize the crank shaft to the newly created optical signature diagram. And that, it's also very simple. All you do then, is set the engine at top dead center. Mount the optical cam and crank sensor simulator to its holding bracket, and point the optical eye of the optical cam and crank sensor simulator to the long sink dark mark, which almost always signifies top dead center. You can stick the optical signature diagram in any position you want. The important part is to then, set the engine at top dead center, and mount and point the simulator to the top dead center long mark. Now, your optical cam and crank sensor simulator is timed properly. You can do this operation in less than a minute. It'll probably take you longer to set the engine in top dead center, than to time the optical cam and crank sensor simulator. Take either the sine wave or square waveform output, and connect it to the input of the vehicle's crank sensor connector. At this point, you're ready to start the engine. For every dark and white mark that the optical cam and crank sensor simulator sees, it'll create a specific square wave signal, filtered by the LM555 microchip, and then fed into the small transformer for both, a sine and square wave output. The usefulness of the optical cam and crank sensor simulator, is in substitution, to diagnose intermittent problems, to check issues with the wiring, to diagnose the ECM, and many more issues whereby, you don't know who's at fault. Is it the ECM, the sensor, the wiring or some other software issue hidden in the maze of technical complexity? The optical cam and crank sensor simulator will be there for you, regardless of vehicle make, model, year or engine type for many years to come.
In this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Drive-by wire motor actuator controller. Warning, warning, warning. Do not use the drive-by wire motor actuator controller with the engine on. The drive-by wire motor actuator controller is meant to be used with key on engine off. Any other use is at your own risk. Gone are the days when the throttle was controlled by a cable. The throttle cable has been omitted in favor of the throttle actuator or drive-by wire throttle control. The vast majority of throttle actuator control motors are the DC duty cycle control type. In other words, the ECM controls a two-terminal DC motor, by way of a duty cycle signal. On duty cycle signals, the frequency and voltage remains constant. What changes, is the positive crest of the waveform. This means that on a square wave, the positive crest changes width. The wider the positive width, the wider the throttle actuator opening. In today's throttle control diagnostics, it is important to be able to actuate the throttle for various reasons. We'll go deeper into using this gadget later. But, suffice it to say that, the drive-by wire motor actuator controller is used to diagnose the multiple throttle position sensor inputs, to clean the throttle body, to determine if motor is binding and to diagnose any of dozens of issues with an electronic throttle actuator system. But first, a word on how the electronic throttle works. The throttle plates are always being forced down by an internal spring. This spring and gear mechanism can start to bind from wear and tear. If that happens, the ECM goes into limping mode, reduces injection pulse, and turns the engine into a virtual lawn mower. It doesn't matter if the throttle sticks in the open position. With injection cut off, your car isn't going anywhere. The drive-by wire motor actuator controller creates the duty cycle control signal to act against the spring load. So, in slow motion, the pulse pulls open the throttle valve, then it supposedly closes again due to the spring action, then the second pulse pulls it open again, and it closes again. But, in reality this happens so fast, that the throttle valve stays open a specific amount of degrees. The wider the duty cycle pulse, the wider the opening. The drive-by wire motor actuator controller works as follows. The whole drive-by wire motor actuator controller is centered around the SG3525 microcircuit. This is a pulse width modulation chip. It is used by many automotive and industrial manufacturers for controlling motors. The SG3525 then controls the base of the transistor, BUK953555 MOSFET driver. The transistor controls the throttle motor itself, depending on the aperture control. The drive-by wire motor actuator controller also has minimum and maximum controls. These are set once, and control the lowest and highest duty cycle possible. Most drive-by wire motors don't work well below 20%, hence this control is set to provide a minimum. You also don't want to feed 100% duty cycle to the throttle motor all the time, which can cause it to fail. Finally, there's a frequency control as well. This control, you also set only once. Remember, duty cycle has nothing to do with frequency. On electronic throttle control the frequency stays constant, or at about 200 to 400 hertz. This control is set only once and then left alone. All the aperture is done with the aperture control, which varies the output from the minimum and maximum, according to these said controls. 
we'd like to reiterate the previous warning. Do not use the drive-by wire motor actuator controller with the engine on. The drive-by wire motor actuator controller is meant to be used with key on engine off. Any other use is at your own risk. The drive-by wire motor actuator controller is a sturdy and tough unit, which will give you many years of service. In this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Something wonderful is about to happen, all these worlds are yours, except Europa, attempt no landing there, use them together, use them in peace, this is how 12,000 signing off. ECM ECU memory saver tool. How many times have you disconnected the battery? and found out that the radio station memory settings are wiped clean, as well as the engine performance is lacking. Well, it all has to do with the CAM memory. CAM stands for Keep Alive Memory and it's a form of adaptive memory. CAM memory works as follows, whenever you drive your vehicle, the car's ECM or engine control module learns each sensor imperfection, and records it on a special memory. This memory has to be connected to power at all times, hence the name, Keep Alive Memory. Any time the battery is disconnected, the CAM memory goes out. In other words, it gets erased. It could take up to a few weeks for the old parameters and imperfections to get recorded again. In the meantime, your vehicle will suffer from drivability issues. It simply won't work the same until the CAM is recorded again. Other issues with disconnecting the vehicle's battery is loss of radio, climate control, GPS and other telematics in the car. In order to do away with all these issues you need a memory saver tool. This tool is connected to the vehicle's cigarette lighter or OBD2 connector to keep the memory going after the battery has been disconnected. In other words, the 9 volts put out by the memory saver tool is enough to maintain the memory chips inside the vehicle's different computers. We have compiled and made available three separate memory saver tools. They're basically the same, but use a different battery or connection arrangement. The first tool uses a simple 9 volt battery and is connected to the lighter plug. Connect the center electrode of the lighter plug to the 9 volt positive terminal. The 9 volt negative terminal goes on the outside electrode of the plug. So, all these plugs are tip positive, as it is called in electrical jargon. The second tool uses more or less the same arrangement, but uses 6 AA batteries instead. Each AA battery is about 1.5 volts, times 6 of them makes it 9 volts. Although the vehicle is a 12 volt system, 9 volt is enough to keep the memory going. Finally, we show you the more advanced of the three memory saver tools, the OBD2 connector based tool. The problem with the cigarette lighter tool is that oftentimes, the respective fuse is blown. If this is the case, connecting the tool will serve no purpose. The 9 volt simply won't reach the circuit, and you probably won't know it. The end result is loss of cam memory. So, the OBD2 tool was created to apply power to pin number 16 of the connector, which is supposed to be constant power. Then pins number 4 and 5 are connected to the 9 volt battery ground. With the OBD2 connector memory saver tool, there's no way the tool won't be able to do its job. It will always be connected, and the cam memory will never lose its touch. This very simple tool is largely overlooked at many repair shops. 
If you ever go for a battery replacement, ask to use this tool. Even if your battery is discharged, the leftover charge is enough for the cam memory. The moment your battery is disconnected, that's when you lose it all. Not a good thing, and with proper care, the memory saver tool will give you the desired results for many years to come. In this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Something wonderful is about to happen, all these worlds are yours, except Europa, attempt no landing there, use them together, use them in peace, this is how 12,000 signing off. Fuel Injector Pulsar Injector pulsars are a main staple component in the arsenal of a modern automotive technician. DIY aficionado or enthusiasts, who needs to perform diagnostics on fuel injectors. The uses for a fuel injector pulses are varied. It is used to pulse and measure the electrical characteristics and general health of an injector, to determine if the injector is clogged, by doing a fuel flow test, and for to fast pulse and clean the injector using special solvents. In essence, this device is what you'll find inside the ECM, with the exception that the LM555 timer chip is substituted by the ECM processor. As with many of our other gadgets, this circuit can be built into an inexpensive universal PC board. The 555 timer is a popular oscillator chip that creates the pulse signal. It is a 25 cent component. This entire circuit can be built for less than $4. An LM393, or dual differential comparator chip is also used to create the duty cycle part of the signal. The other components are off-the-shelf resistors, potentiometers and small capacitors readily available anywhere. This circuit works as follows. This device uses a built-in pulse width modulated signal generator circuit for triggering a power MOSFET, which is a high current transistor. This particular transistor, the IRF740 is rated up to 400 volts and can switch around 10 amps which makes it quite useful for power switching in inductive loads. The fuel injector pulsar circuit will run on a 12 volts DC supply. The circuit is great for controlling the power delivered to an injector, and by adjusting the pulse width, you can easily control the fuel flow which is useful for doing a fuel flow test, where the injector pulse specifications is very important. When doing a fuel flow test, the frequency and duty cycle of the pulse has to be exact, but more on this later. The 555 timer chip develops the pulse wave needed, but with no power to it. It is then fed into the LM393 for processing. The two potentiometers control the frequency and the duty cycle of the pulse, but also at very little power levels. This is called the preamp part of the circuit. Finally, the MOSFET, or field effect transistor acts as a current amplifier, and is able to drive the coil of the injector. This is the power stage of the circuit, and it is also protected by a flyback diode and one microfarad capacitor, to protect against the collapsing magnetic field high voltage at the injector coil. The fuel injector pulsar is meant to also be used by pulsing the injector for a specific amount of time, collecting the fuel or cleaning fluid, and measuring against a graduated beaker. This is the definitive way to know for sure if the fuel injector is not clogged. The unit can also be encased in a plastic enclosure fitted with a long lead cable for testing injectors. This is a rugged injector pulsar, 
and with proper care should serve you for many years to come. In this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Something wonderful is about to happen, all these worlds are yours, except Europa, attempt no landing there, use them together, use them in peace, this is how 12,000 signing off. Stress loaded test light. A very big misconception in the field is that of the meaning of a load. A load is not a voltage or current. A load is not applying voltage or current to a circuit to see what it does. A load applied to a circuit will not destroy the circuit, it will simply blow its respective fuse if too high. A load can only mean one thing, a load is a resistance. The amount of ohms or resistance value will determine how big the load is. For example, a low ohm resistor, say 5 to 10 ohm is a very large load. On the other hand, a 100 to 1000 ohm resistor is a very small load. So, the relationship of load to ohm value is inversely proportional. The reason why a small ohm, or small resistive value is a large load, is because the smaller the ohm value, the higher the current flow of electrons. Remember this, high current equals heat and therefore stress to the circuit. All circuits are protected by a fuse, so, when using the stress loaded test light, do not remove the fuse that feeds the circuit you are testing. Also, the stress loaded test light is protected by a second fuse. In our stress loaded test light, we'll be using what's considered a general load or resistance value of 5 ohms. In the past, automotive technicians have used a headlight to do a loaded circuit test, which also has a nominal 5 to 10 ohms resistance. The issue with a headlight is that as the filament heats up, the resistance changes or tends to drop and, the worst part is that if it falls it breaks into pieces. With the stress leaded test light all these issues are resolved. The only other piece of equipment that even compares is the loaded battery alternator tester. These come either with a load knob, which increases the load as you turn, or an electronic unit that creates a low resistance value. It is amazing that no other equipment manufacturer has put out a device to stress load the circuit as you're testing it. Loading a circuit during testing is done so that its faulty issues reveal themselves. This can be applied especially to ground and power feed tests, and to higher current components, such as cooling fan motors, lighting circuits, compressor clutches and even injectors. This is how the stress loaded test light works. We'll start by using two large ceramic resistors, connected in parallel as our load. These resistors are inexpensive, and take up a lot of heat. Remember, a high load means a small ohm value, and therefore, some heat. It is also a good idea to either use a heat sink on the resistors, or a metal case or pipe for the test light itself. The idea here is to use inexpensive components, lowering the cost to make this super useful gadget. In this circuit we can see that current flows from ground, through the parallel resistor pack, through the 5 amp fuse and to 12 volt power. Also, parallel to the dual resistor load is a series single color LED and a 630 ohm resistor. Here's how these two guys work. Whenever the circuit that we're testing, whether ground or power, can provide enough current, about 2.5 amps will flow through the load resistors. Then, at the same time about 20 milliamps also flow through the LED, lighting it up. On the other hand, if the circuit cannot provide enough power, 
or at least 2.5 amps. The load resistors will suck up all the current and the LED will never see enough current for it to light up. We've also added an extra screw on light bulb, to be able to detect current intensity, since LED are great for on and off situations, but are not good at providing levels of intensity. The end result is a complete circuit loading solution that'll give you years of operation. Next, we'll see how to use this tool in the real world. In this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Something wonderful is about to happen, all these worlds are yours, except Europa, attempt no landing there, use them together, use them in peace, this is how 12,000 signing off. Fuse Voltage Drop Short Identifier The Fuse Voltage Drop Short Identifier is simply a very sensitive voltmeter. This unit is used mainly to do a voltage drop across very small electrical loads. They may include the alternator wire, which prevents the battery from being charged, and doing a voltage drop test across individual fuses. If doing a fuse voltage drop test with the fuse voltage drop short identifier, then you'll need our special voltage to amp erage chart, available here. The fuse voltage drop short identifier works in conjunction with a 10 ohm resistor. The resistor, right at the gadget's input, drops the actual voltage. Then, the voltage dropped is fed to the 741 op amp input. The op amp also has a 10k ohm variable resistor for the zero function, and its output is fed right to the needle volt meter. The gadget uses a dual 9 volt battery power feed input. The dual power feed is meant for negative values, in case there's an issue with the ground. If this is the case, the current flow will often reverse itself depending on the ground potential. This unit can be built for under $12. The fuse voltage drop short identifier has an on switch, and an LED indicator to note the on position. It is protected by diodes D1 through D4 at the inputs. The 10 ohm input resistor draws a maximum of 1.5 amps at 14.7 volts, not enough to cause damage even if it is a dead short. The reason why this resistor is so small, is to raise the sensitivity of the voltmeter. The 10 ohm resistor should be a ceramic type resistor, with a heat sink to it. This unit is meant to measure small parasitic voltages, and with enough care, should last you a very long time. In this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Something wonderful is about to happen, all these worlds are yours, except Europa, attempt no landing there, use them together, use them in peace, this is how 12,000 signing off. Fuse voltage drop short identifier. Okay, I would like all of you now to consider one wonderful idea. 
One idea that may save all of you time and money. An idea, developed over many months, and with one specific goal in mind. How do we find an automotive short, in the fastest way possible? And, how do we do this, without disconnecting anything at all? Well, this is the very first video of its kind. The voltage charts in here, as well as the equipment, was developed over many months, and doing the required research and development. So, here we go. The voltage drop short identifier is both, a gadget and a research chart to be able to find short circuits in a modern automobile. In today's automotive world, you can not disconnect and reconnect fuses and modules to find electrical short. Every time a module is disconnected, it'll do a reboot, which may take a long time to complete. Meanwhile, while rebooting it'll draw some current skewing your diagnostics. With the voltage drop short identifier, you can detect faint voltage drops without any disassembly. The voltage drop short identifier is nothing more than a very sensitive voltmeter, made for the exact purpose of doing voltage drops across fuses. A normal voltmeter is fine, but only if the short is large enough. Most digital voltmeters are not accurate in the low millivolt range. The inexpensive voltage drop short identifier can do it all. It can find parasitic current draws, tiny shorted components in the 2 to 10 milliamp range, faulty modules that stay awake all the time, draining the battery. The voltage drop short identifier is used with our provided voltage drop chart. You need to understand that the chart, provides a way to convert voltage drop across a fuse, into a current value. In other words, each fuse is like a straight wire. However, all conductors do have tiny resistances to them, in the milliohm range. These small resistances are impossible to measure using normal ohm meters. So, the only way to see if a fuse is on, or conducting electrical current, is doing a voltage drop test, with a very sensitive voltmeter, which is why the voltage drop short identifier is needed. You may use a laboratory grade voltmeter, but be prepared to shell out lots of money. A normal digital ohm meter is not sensitive enough. There are older analog voltmeters, like the Simpson 260 voltmeter that may also do the job, but they're not cheap. So, to use the voltage drop short identifier, measure across the fuse. Remember, each type of fuse has a specific characteristics. So, a 10 amp mini fuse, at 10 millivolts, will mean a different current flow than a 10 amp maxi fuse, also at 10 millivolts. In other words, the value of this technique and the voltage drop short identifier is in also using the chart provided here, to determine current flow. Once you've determined the voltage drop across the fuse, compared it to the chart, then determine if it's higher than 10 milliamps or so. The entire car can not have a combined current draw higher than 20 milliamps or so. Most fuses will have zero, or no higher than 3 milliamps of current flowing through them. Most small, battery draining shorts, will raise current consumption higher than 35 milliamps. As soon as you see 18 milliamps or higher in one single fuse alone, you found your troubled circuit. Then, follow a power distribution wiring diagram, and start disconnecting every component that's connected to that fuse. Disconnect and leave disconnected. Do not reconnect again. As soon as the culprit component is disconnected, your voltage drop short identifier reading will drop and issue solved. This technique was brought to you only in here, and seen nowhere else with our fully researched fuse voltage drop chart. Our chart was developed by first using a high resistance rheostat as a load, and measuring voltage drops across all the different types of fuses, together with the fuse box and wiring harnesses. We acquired various wiring harnesses from local salvage yards, 
and finally double checked the numbers using various vehicles over many months. Our chart is solid and very reliable. As a final note, it is worth mentioning that even after you've found your shorted component, it is advisable to also connect an amp meter in series, and double check the issue. This is simply an insurance against replacing any good component. And, with proper care, the voltage drop short identifier should last you many years to come. Here, is the volts to amps chart as developed by us over many months of testing. Hopefully, it'll serve you well. In this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Ignition Key Transponder Detector Modern automotive anti-theft systems, use a coded ignition key to authorize the engine turn on. In most cases, another module or computer, such as the ECM, body control module, or the instrument cluster module, serves as the actual anti-theft module. The way the anti-theft systems works is through an ignition key transponder. The ignition key transponder is embedded inside the back or plastic side of the ignition key. It is a non-battery operated circuit. This circuit is powered by an induction coil, that generates a current in the key transponder coil itself, which powers the signal cogeneration circuit. The code is then received by the anti-theft module, and an OK command is then issued for engine start. Now that we've given the brief overview of the circuit, we present here, the ignition key transponder detector. Well, you might ask, why do we need this gadget? The answer is simple, because it allows you to know if the key transponder itself is working, tells you if a new key is not a fake, and will even decode the pass key code, and show you as an oscilloscope waveform. Here, is how the ignition key transponder detector works. The ignition key transponder detector works in the 120 to 135 kilohertz frequency range, and is built around only two micro circuits, a 74AC04 and a 74HCT74. It also employs a 690 millihenries coil, that you can wind yourself using transformer wire. The first part of the circuit is the oscillator that excites the ignition key transponder's internal coil. This action induces a current to power the ignition key transponder chip. So, power goes from the ignition key transponder detector coil to the ignition key transponder coil inside the key plastic backing. Once the ignition key transponder is activated, it'll send the pass code which is then detected by the ignition key transponder detector. So the ignition key transponder detector coil sends power, and detects at the same time. The second part of the circuit, filters out all the hash from the power generation part and carrier wave, and only leaves the pass code. At this point, you can feed the detected code to an oscilloscope and have a clear waveform view of the actual pass key code. You'd have to freeze the actual waveform to view the fast moving digital code. Then, the pass code is also fed to the 74HCT74 microchip to drive the green LED. This last part of the circuit simply receives the digital code, senses the positive peaks of the square wave, and drives the LED. For all practical purposes, you don't need an oscilloscope. 
just put the key close to the 690 milli Henry coil, seen here with red arrow, and watch the LED blink. If it does, then it is a true ignition key transponder key, and not a fake. Many people are being duped by unscrupulous vendors of so-called, legitimate ignition transponder keys, which are really empty shells. It is a regrettable fact, but the ignition key transponder detector will tell you the real story. We'll later learn how to use this gadget. But, for now, know that the ignition key transponder detector will serve you well for many years to come. In this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Using the ignition key transponder detector. We've already explained how to build an ignition key transponder detector. Now let's explore the need for this gadget and how to use it. Have you ever wanted to bypass your anti-theft system? Ever lost your car's ignition key and had to buy, cut, and reprogram your new key? What if your vehicle won't accept the new key? What if the new key is fine, but your car still won't start? Well, the issue can be traced to a few problem areas. But, if you can't determine the operation of your key, you're done. The only other way is to have a factory scanner, but these are thousands of dollars, and out of reach for most repair shops and do-it-selfers. Here are the possible problem areas, and how to go about repairing them. In order to do a proper anti-theft diagnostic, do the following. First, determine if the ignition key is working. 90% of consumers replace the ignition key, have it cut to later find out that the key is not the issue. Use the ignition key transponder detector to verify the key transponder. If the green LED starts blinking, you're fine. If not, replace the key. It is common to also purchase an ignition key, to later find out it's a fake. A key without a transponder will never work. Another use for the ignition key transponder detector is that of adapting another key cylinder to the car. Here's how, let's assume that you current ignition cylinder coil or key is faulty, and that you manage to purchase a used cylinder and keys, from a local salvage yard. The first use of the ignition key transponder detector is to determine if the salvage yard keys are operational. If so, then you've got a done deal. You don't have to cut keys and all your components are there. Almost always, these parts are not sold because people don't know if the system works. The ignition key transponder detector tells you all you need to know. Yet, another use for the ignition key transponder detector is to match a key to your car. For example, lots of technicians manage to start a vehicle with a new key taped to the back of the valet or metal only key. This is done just to check the anti-theft computer, and see if it takes a new key program. However, most shops or locksmiths have a few of these blank keys laying around for testing. With the ignition key transponder detector, you use the scope waveform feature capture the digital passcode signal, and use it for future reference. Later on, just compare whichever key you think you matched to the car, and proceed from there. The ignition key transponder detector, can also be used by locksmiths and salvage yards to detect operational keys to be sold as a complete package, with the ignition key and cylinder. Finally, the ignition key transponder detector can also be used to do a bypass of your vehicle's anti-theft system. It won't help a thief steal a car, but some car owners don't really care for this system at all. To do a bypass, 
record or capture the pass key code using the oscilloscope. Then, use a programmable signal generator, which is a simple chip box, that accepts a recorded digital code. Attach a 690 milli Henry's coil to it, and tape the coil to the inside of the ignition key coil or close to it. Now, every time you insert and turn your ignition key on, it'll power the code box, transmit the store code to the car's anti-theft system, and you vehicle will start. This process is too involved to be useful for a car thief, but works well with the consumer that don't care for anti-theft systems. Simply put, the ignition key transponder detector will give you its worth for years to come. In this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Something wonderful is about to happen, all these worlds are yours, except your open, attempt no landing there, use them together, use them in peace, this is how 12,000 signing off. Ignition primary dis, cop probe. It is hard to believe, why tool and equipment manufacturers, haven't made an effort to make a viable and useful DIS distributorless ignition system, or COP coil on plug probe, like the ignition primary DIS, COP probe. The reason is probably because it can be built inexpensively, and therefore, their profit margins wouldn't amount to much. Now, to shed some light on the subject. All forms of distributorless ignition systems, whether coil on plug or waste spark systems, employ separate ignition coil circuits to fire the spark plugs. In most modern engines, DIS has given way to the coil per cylinder system, called, coil on plug. With the distributor gone, which was a mechanical device, it is now easier to acquire ignition signals. Or, is it really? Well, maybe not. The problem is that coil on plugs are buried deep in the cylinder head. Access to the secondary is now a major issue in misfire diagnostics. However, the ignition primary DIS, COP probe is here to save the day. But, before we go into it, you need to understand one fact. On ignition coils, the secondary is the high voltage spark carrying circuit, but, the primary, which is actuated by the ignition module, is a mirror image of the secondary. So, again, the primary, is a mirror image, of the secondary. You don't need to access the secondary at all to get an ignition waveform. The ignition primary DIS, COP probe works as follows. Input protection diodes D1 through D12 are connected to the coil primary pulsed side. This is the side being pulsed to ground by the module, or as it is done now, by the ECM. Because of the way the diodes are connected, there is no cross connection at all. So one coil primary will not trigger the other. Afterwards, the inputs at the other end of the diodes are tied together, and fed to a resistor voltage divider network. Remember, this is a 10 to 1 reduction gadget. Most ignition primary voltages, can go as high as 80 volts or more. The ignition primary DIS, COP probe will drop this voltage down 10 times. So, when reading the oscilloscope waveform, take that into account. We've made no attempt here to clip the ignition inductive kick. What you'll get is a clean, unadulterated ignition waveform and, it'll give you many years of service.
In this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. How to use the Ignition Primary DISCOP Probe Using the Ignition Primary Disc Probe is a very straightforward operation. As we've said before, the primary of the ignition coil is a mirror image of the secondary. So, a misfire will also reflect on the primary, and be able to be picked up by the Ignition Primary Disc Probe. Connect each of the alligator clips of the ignition primary disc probe to the pulsed side of each ignition coil. Remember that the coils are not going to be triggered all at the same time. So, when we connect the oscilloscope to the ignition primary disc probe, each coil pulse will arrive one after the other. Most scopes have two input channels. Connect the ignition primary disc probe to channel 2 and use channel 1 as a cylinder 1 sink. In other words, you're going to sync the ignition pulses to channel 1 or cylinder number 1. All you need to do then is figure out the firing order for the engine you're working on, and voila, you now have a complete ignition analyzer at a fraction of the cost. Any modern digital DSO or digital storage oscilloscope can be turned into a full-fledged ignition analyzer. If you want to get fancier, a future specifications, cylinder, and firing order Android app will be available. So, here's a little bit more insight on using the ignition primary disc probe. First, after connecting the ignition primary disc probe, you need to find out which is cylinder 1. This is normally identified by determining the cylinder head closer to the front, on a V-type engine. On that side, the frontmost cylinder is number 1. Use channel 1, and connect to cylinder 1 primary. That'll be your synchronization pulse. To read the ignition pulse, you need to analyze three points on the waveform. 1, the firing line also called the spark line. This line happens after the ignition on pulse. It is the result of the magnetic field collapsing on itself. It should reach at least 40 volts, signaling good spark reserve. A good waveform library is a must. The left edge of the firing line is the ignition pulse turn-off point. Make sure it's clean. If not, it points to a faulty ignition driver transistor. 2. The spark duration line which precedes the firing line. This measure says exactly how long the spark endured. It is an indication of the condition of the ignition components, such as plugs, wires or boots, and even the coil itself. This line also says a lot about the air-fuel mixture, whether it's lean or rich. Finally, the ignition pulse turn-off and oscillations. The turn-off a point gives you the relative condition also of the ignition parts. It should be fairly clean and sudden. There is a notion of information that can be extracted from the ignition primary waveform, enough for a whole book on the subject. The important thing is that you don't have to spend lots of money to be able to diagnose a misfiring problem. All scopes, with the aid of the ignition primary disc probe can capture ignition waveforms, which by the way, is by far the only way to properly diagnose an ignition system. With proper training and care, the ignition primary disc probe will give you lots of satisfaction at jobs well served, and years of service. In 
this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Something wonderful is about to happen, all these worlds are yours, except you're open, attempt no landing there, use them together, use them in peace, this is how 12,000 signing off. Injector and coil magnetic detector. How many times have you encountered a vehicle, with a coil on plug misfiring engine, which is so tight? that you would need at least half an hour to dismantle the surrounding plastic parts, just to get access to the injector or ignition coil. Well, we now present you here with a very simple gadget that definitely works. This is an injector and coil magnetic detector, with the ability to detect high current devices, but more aptly made for ignition coils and injectors. The gadget circuit is very simple. It uses an inexpensive component called, a reed switch. This is nothing more than a simple contact, on and off clear glass device that's activated by magnetic fields. It is sensitive enough to detect ignition and injector coils. This gadget however, is not meant to be used with an oscilloscope to be able to read coil and injector waveforms, picked up from the air. For that you'll need an amplified injector and coil magnetic detector, which we'll cover later on. This simple gadget will tell you right away whether a coil or injector is operational, is being triggered by the ECM, or that it's building up a good magnetic field around it. It won't tell you if the injector is clogged, or if the plugs are fouled up, but it's a tremendous starting point for your diagnostics. The circuit is a simple series type, which includes a 9 volt battery, a 1K resistor as a current limiter, an LED to signal the presence of a coil or injector actuation, and the actual read switch. It is important to keep the read away from the circuit, and encase it in some form of probe, as shown here. We've used a simple clear body of a pen, and a small enclosure of either plastic or PCV tubing to protect the gadget. The cost of the injector and coil magnetic detector is less than $3, can detect a working cylinder by just probing from as far as 7 inches, and with some practice and a small metal shield can be made to pinpoint higher current electrical shorts, by tracing the wire through the harness. In the past, some techs have used a compass to do similar tasks, but the injector and coil magnetic detector is more exact and professional providing you with years of excellent service. This video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Something wonderful is about to happen, all these worlds are yours, except you're open, attempt no landing there, use them together, use them in peace, this is how 12,000 signing off. Loaded injector noid light. Noid lights are mainstay in automotive diagnostics, and injector repair. Anoid light is connected across the injector circuit, by disconnecting the injector circuit, and connecting it in place of the injector. The issue with anoid light is that it barely loads the circuit. In other words, anoid light is a regular filament light, which draws very little current, and not stressing the circuit. In other words, you could still have a faulty injector driver transistor and anoid light would blink like nothing was wrong. This is the danger of being misled by the noid light. The loaded injector noid light is the next step in evolution for a noid light. 
It is a simple gadget. It also proves how little attention is paid by equipment makers to what's really needed out in the field. The loaded injector noid light is a simple filament bulb, which is needed for injector testing, and a 20 ohm resistor in parallel with it. An LED is not a good option to test injectors. It simply draws too little current for the measurement to be definitive. The loaded injector noid light will pinpoint issues with the injector driver transistor, the 12 volt power feed to the injector, the ground at the ECM or the injector itself. Here's how the simple, but updated gadget works. Current flows from the ECM ground, through its driver transistor, and through the injector coil to 12 volt power. Remember, at idle or 900 RPM, is not 12.6 volts anymore, and more like 14.7 volts. At that voltage level, any injector will draw a nominal 950 milliamps. With the injector disconnected, the 20 ohm resistor across the noid light and the filament light bulb draw about 1.1 amps or so. This is within the range of current for an injector driver and it's sure to stress the circuit to its maximum. For the most part, injector drivers can handle a lot more than 2 or 3 amps, so the loaded injector noid light is not that stressful to the circuit, but does the job nicely. When using the light, there are various techniques you can do to identify which part of the system is causing problems, such as injector driver transistor, voltage power feed to the injector, power relay, the ground at the ECM ground wire or the injector itself. We'll discuss these techniques later. With proper care, the loaded injector noid light is bound to give many years of satisfaction guaranteed. In this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Something wonderful is about to happen, all these worlds are yours, except you're open, attempt no landing there, use them together, use them in peace, this is how 12,000 signing off. Using the loaded injectonoid light. As we saw before. The loaded injectonoid light is used to stress the ECM provided injector pulse circuitry. Here are a few techniques used on the process. When we use the loaded injectonoid light, there are two possible scenarios. One, is that the loaded injectonoid pulse is fine, in which case the issue is in the injector itself, either clogged or it is an open circuit coil. Two, is that the loaded injectonoid light does not pulse or blink when the engine is cranked. Remember, you disconnect the injector and substitute or connect the loaded injectonoid light in place of the injector. So, if no pulse is seen, then here are ways to identify the source of the trouble. Scenario 1. Determine power feed current flow supply. You could have an issue with the 12 volt feed, and still, a normal noid or volt meter would still show a lit, or 12 volts reading, as if nothing was wrong. Therefore, connect one side of the loaded injector noid light to the injector power feed wire, and the other side to a good ground. The loaded injector noid light will load the circuit. If you see it lit, there are at least 1.2 amps flowing, in which case power feed is fine. Scenario 2. Determine if the ECM is providing a good ground pulse to the injector. The ECM pulses and grounds the injector to supply fuel during engine operation. If the ground provided by the ECM is faulty or weak, a regular test light, noid light or voltmeter will show no issues. But, the loaded injector noid light will definitely fail to light up if there's a circuit issue. So, 
connect the pulsed wire of the injector to the loaded injectonoid light, and the other side to battery positive. Crank the engine, and you should see a strong pulsing loaded injectonoid light. If not, then let's continue tracing the issue. Scenario 3. Determine if the issue is at the ECM ground or the AECM driver transistor itself. Leave the loaded injectonoid light connected as it were, then remove the ECM connector, and jump the injector wire to the different ECM ground pins. It is impossible to know which of these grounds is used for the injector. So, the quickest and most complete test is to test all grounds. If no joy on the loaded injectonoid light, then trace and repair the ECM grounds. If the loaded injectonoid light lights up, then issue is with the AECM itself. Make sure that the ECM is not in injector cutoff, due to overheating or some other issue. If that's not the case, then the ECM injector driver transistor or circuit is gone. Replace it or replace the ECM. The loaded injectonoid light, used properly will prove and detect all sorts of injector issues, and provide you with years of satisfaction. In this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Something wonderful is about to happen, all these worlds are yours, except you're open, attempt no landing there, use them together, use them in peace, this is how 12,000 signing off. Automotive low pressure transducer. Pressure transducers are used in conjunction with a measuring device such as a multimeter of oscilloscope to detect a changing pressure. Pressure transducers are very useful in detecting all kinds of auto repair issues, such as follows. When connected to the fuel pressure regulator to detect minor fluctuations in the fuel pressure when injectors open and close, thereby, revealing a clogged injector, used to detect exhaust gas flow output, revealing issues with the valve train, in case of a burnt valve, an exhaust pressure transducer will flag a busted valve if the signal is properly interpreted. There are dozens of cases when a pressure transducer is useful in auto repair and diagnostics. So here's how to build your own pressure transducer. First, it's worth saying that the heart of a pressure transducer is the piezoelectric device that does the actual measurement. If we were to build this tool from scratch, we would need a few auxiliary components to make the circuit work. Remember. This device is not just a piezoelectric gadget by itself, you need a way to process the signal worthy for an oscilloscope or graphing meter. By far, the easiest and fastest way to make this device is to use an already made component. In our case, we've done our homework and researched various components. We'll use a fuel tank pressure sensor for the heart of our pressure transducer, readily available at your local parts place or salvage yard. All modern cars use a fuel tank's pressure sensor. We made various transducers using Toyota and General Motors fuel tank pressure sensors and they all use 5 volts as a reference. Here in this circuit we can see that the pressure transducer is connected to two outside components, a 5 volt Zener diode and a resistor. The Zener and the resistor in series will give us the reference signal that the fuel tank pressure sensor needs to work. We will also use a 9 volt battery as our power source. It is possible to connect the 9 volt battery straight into the tank pressure sensor, but in our tests we've seen issues with the readings at the higher end of the measuring scale. This circuit says that current flows from ground, through the series Zener resistor parent to 9 volt positive. The 5 volt reference is tapped right in the middle. 
We can then connect the tank pressure sensor reference voltage to this point between the Zener resistor series bear, and we can take our output signal right at the fuel tank pressure sensor output without any further processing. Remember that the tank pressure sensor is a high impedance device, fit for an oscilloscope, multimeter of graphing meter. Interpreting the output waveform is another matter, which takes some time to master and worthy of another video series. This circuit mean a saving of at least $100 less, over whatever is in the market right now. With this parts list you can build your own pressure transducer and get reliable waveforms worthy of any modern laboratory. The parts list that follows is all you'll need to build this device and get many years of service out of it. In this video you will see ingenious ways to make your own diagnostic equipment. These procedures and plans have been tried and built, but given the nature of the detailed work needed, we make no guarantees. It is ultimately up to you, a skilled technician or DIY genius to make it work. Building the Low Pressure Transducer You've previously seen how the low pressure transducer works. Now, we'll show you how to build this gadget in the simplest way possible. As you can see, this tool requires only a few parts. The fuel tank pressure sensor, a resistor and zener diode, a 9 volt battery and clip, and two alligator clips. The upper 50 ohm resistor is a current limiter and the 5 volts reference is taken at the junction point, between the resistor and diode. The two upward looking wire is the output to the voltmeter or scope, one at the ground, the other at the fuel tank pressure sensor signal terminal. The other two terminals at the sensor, are the 5 volts reference and the sensor ground. In this build animation, we've also used two alligator clips used for connecting to the vehicle battery. This is not necessary, but we just give you the option of either the 9 volt battery or vehicle power. The Zener diode and resistor combo will always regulate the voltage to 5 volts, which is what the sensor needs. This entire circuit can be folded, and then encased in a PVC or plastic enclosure for protection. It is also possible to use epoxy resin to encase the whole circuit and protect it from moisture. Finally, you can see the pressure or vacuum port at the end, which is where a hose is connected to sample the pressure. This gadget, if encased in epoxy will render many, many years of service. This channel is for do-it-yourselfers, as well as professional auto repair technicians. We present all the content using the latest CG animation techniques, on hands video, and how to, tips and techniques. We encourage you to subscribe to this channel now. Once subscribed, anytime we upload a new automotive tip, secret, or technology video, you will be notified. Finally, by subscribing, you will also be part of our weekly freebies. Yes, we're constantly giving away lots of free merchandise. Automotive Diagnostics and Publishings, Mandy Concepcion, the owner of this channel, is one of the most prolific auto technology authors on the web. At any moment in time, we may offer a free book, Kindle eBook, Android app, one of our own diagnostic equipment, or even auto repair software that runs on your PC. Subscribe now free of charge, learn lots of automotive technology secrets, and win free stuff. It doesn't get any better than that. Thanks for watching, and enjoy.